Okay. Today, we got one little word. And no, I'm not going to say one little word and stop. Y'all just got one little word. Come. Okay? If somebody said, all right, I noticed this. The choir was going that way, and all y'all sat back there. You didn't start coming to the front until Ms. Elizabeth started playing the piano. It was like that was y'all's cue to get up and come <coughs> to the front, right? Used to, I would come from the back, and I'd have to peek around the corner and say, come on, <laughs> but y'all now you'll come on up here. But Jesus tells us to come, okay? He tells us to come to him when we have <coughs> burdens, when our hearts are heavy, when we have a problem, when somebody we love is sick. He tells us to come to him. Okay. He also tells us to come when children. He says nobody's to keep the children from coming to him. And I remember this. There was, used to be a picture with Jesus sitting like on a rock and all the little children were sitting around Jesus' feet. And that's the verse that went with that picture was let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. Okay, and I can see that picture just as good as if it was hanging on the wall over there. Because when I was a kid, that picture was in a Sunday school class, or it was somewhere that I saw that picture, and that verse, I guess, will forever be engraved in my mind. But we need to come. Revelation, the preacher's going to be, we're getting to the end of that. But we want to be sure. And I know y'all probably tired of hearing me say that. But we want to be sure that when he comes back, that we are ready to go with him. He gives us an invitation. And it's very simple. The word is come. And all we have to do is accept that invitation to come to him and to live for him. And then when he does come back and says, come on, we're going we won't have to be thinking, did I, did I do that? We, we will have assurance in our heart and in our soul that when he said to us, come, we accepted that invitation. And it's, not, it's for anybody. It's not just for little kids. It's for anybody. And it seems like the older you get, maybe the harder it is. If you fall away, it's harder to come back sometimes. But we always have to know and never doubt that he is waiting for us. He's got his arms stretched out and he is telling us to come. He is asking us to come. He is giving us an invitation. And that is something that even if you're already saved, that is something that should give you joy. That should make you happy to know that you've accepted his invitation to come. And to be part of his family. And not just for the kids, but anybody in here, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no better invitation that you'll ever get than the one word come. of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the place 
that are written in this book. <clears throat> and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Consider this a spoiler if you, if you don't want to hear what I'm going to say. I'm going to stick your fingers in your hand. The story thread revolves around the Pevensey children. They're brothers and sisters in London who get separated from their parents during World War II as the city is bombed by the German warplanes. The parents of these four children die, and the story begins with the children, Peter, Lucy, Edmund and Susan, who are sent to a relative's estate in the country for safety. London being bombed, go to the country, right? It's at this country home that they find a passageway through a magical wardrobe. Lion, witch, and the wardrobe, that's the first of the series, right? And they enter a fantasy land called Narnia, and that fantasy land is ruled by a king by the name of Aslan. They become, these children do, they become warriors against the evil forces that are trying to overcome and overtake Narnia, and they succeed for a while. Kind of sounds like our world today, doesn't it? The forces of evil. Well, over the course of many trips to Narnia, and uh, at the end of each book, they get sent back to their present time. They live for a period of time there, then they come back through the wardrobe again, back and forth back and forth. Over the course of many trips to Narnia, evil is conquered. The war is finally won. And this next paragraph that I'm going to read to you occurs after all of the danger is finally passed. Evil has been defeated. Aslan is on the throne. And everybody takes a deep breath. Quote, Aslan turned to them, the four children, and said, you do not yet look so happy as I mean you to be. Lucy said, We're so afraid of being sent away, Aslan, and you have sent us back to our own world so often. No fear of that, said Aslan. Have you not guessed? And their hearts leaped, and a wild hope rose within them. Aslan continues, There was a real <coughs> railway accident, said Aslan softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. <coughs> the holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And so ends the entire series. As he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily together. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. 
All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So ends what C.S. Lewis wrote. Have you ever said, I just don't know what's going to happen next? You get surprised, and not in a happy way, a lot of times. But the way C.S. Lewis ends his whole series on Narnia and all of the events that have happened was a new day. The dream has ended, this is the morning in which every chapter is better than the one before. No more evil surprises. Some interpretation of these parallels might be helpful to round out of what I have given as a very quick analogy from the mind of C.S. Lewis. Aslan the lion, the king who rules over Narnia, he is so named for who? There's a parallel here. Where are we, church? We're in church. Who is our Lord? Jesus. Is he not the Lion of Judah? Yep. Is there any reason why C.S. Lewis would not have chosen Aslan to be named after the Lion of Judah or Aslan to be a lion in this character? What about the Pevensey children? Who do they represent? Well, you know, I think their picture can be located by every single one of us if we will just look in the mirror. The children are us. And what about the wardrobe where they enter this fantasy land, which is the never-ending good place? Well, that wardrobe can be compared with the casket in those graves out there. An entry into a world where we've never seen it before and in which there are mysterious futures. You and I call it heaven. Those are the few parallels that I'd like to draw this morning. Anyone that I've ever asked is aware, I think at least, of the dream of an imagining that you're in a dream. Have you ever dreamed that you're dreaming? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, this whole life is all a dream? I wonder if it's all a dream. What will happen when I wake up? Won't everything be better? And the dream will finally be over and my good life will be here. C.S. Lewis used this dream desire that each of us has, um, the dream desire for a better world, as a reasonable assumption that this dream that he's talking about here in all those books is consistent with how you and I are hardwired, we are created to know because of the imprint of the Father's image on our souls, that this dream, apart from the Father, will eventually end because it is far from that for, for which God des designed us. And that's a mouthful. And I want to give you what C.S. Lewis did to shore that up in explaining all of those seven books, in explaining this dream, fantasy land of Narnia, King Aslan, the Pevensey children, who are us, and the wardrobe, the entryway into the fantasy world, away from the bombing of, uh, of warships. This is how he said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. Can you say that with me? I was made for another world. Have you ever felt that way? Elizabeth and I had this fantasy, I think both of us, that it would be great for us to be born in the Victorian era, you know, where, where men tip their hats to the ladies and open the car door and all that stuff. Um, that's that hope that lies within us. It's not an I hope, I hope, I hope kind of hope. It is the blessed hope of the sure promise of God Amen. that there is a heaven and it's waiting for us. One indication of this is not just the bad stuff that's happening these days. Jesus uh, prophesied all about this in Matthew chapter 24. 
There'd be wars and rumors of wars. There'd be famine. There'd be climate woes. There'd be anger, earthquakes, persecution. Jesus predicted all of this on his perch on Mount Olivet when he gave really his departing sermon. And some of the really exciting stuff is just now happening. But Shropshire sent me uh, an article, linked to an article uh, this past week that just so falls in with everything that we're talking about here and have been studying about. There's a movement right now, this article has this uh, information about this movement that's happening in Israel, in the Jews, among the Jewish people, to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem on its original site. They are now working, and it started just recently, actually May 14th, is uh, the Independence Day for Israel, and it was all, it was to begin, it was to commence on May 14th. So just yesterday, they started cutting stones for in anticipation of reconstructing God's house on the original site. Isn't that exciting? Why, Russell? Why is that so exciting? People over you know a world away from us. Cutting those stones to rebuild a temple. Okay, all right. We see churches constructed all the time. What about that? Why is it so exciting? Because, folks, one of the marks of the coming of Jesus, one of the signs that Jesus talked about, is not only the fields white unto harvest, where it seems like people are going astray from God and going away from God. One of the signs is a select group of people starting to get really interested in where they have been and what Scripture says about where they are going. And that's the Jews. In the end times, we just studied this, there'll be 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, that will turn to Christ in an unprecedented way. You realize how close we are getting? We, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the waiting room of the second advent. God is just waiting to pull the trigger on this. The good news about the good world coming is incredibly good. We are invited to that good new world. He's saying to us this morning, and he started with Debbie's message to the children. What did she say? It's the invitation. In the scripture, which ends the Holy Bible's final words, Jesus offers this invitation. He says, come. And he says it in three different ways. Or he says that it is said in three different ways. First of all, the spirit and the bride say, come. What spirit? Capitalized S, right? The Holy Spirit says, come. There was a time in your life and you know it very well, and God said to you by his spirit, come, come to me. You need me. I want you to be with me. You know that. We call it drawing. The Holy Spirit draws us close to him, to love him, to choose him, to be chosen by him, to identify with him, to be his. The spirit and the bride. Where's the bride? All right. Raise your hand, bride. The bride is the church. That, everywhere through the scripture, the bride always represents the church. So the spirit and the bride say, come. The Holy Spirit and the church say, come. Come to Jesus. Everybody who truly hears this invitation is also to repeat it so that others know that it's okay to come with to Jesus. And then thirdly, everybody who thirsts, everybody who has that desire inside for this new world, for this end of the conflict, for this time when Aslan or Jesus, the Lion of Judah, rules, and there's no objection anymore. There's no debate anymore. There's no need for any more elections. Praise God! <laughs> Why? Because the final objection will have been raised and put to death. There'll be no more objection to the rule of Christ. Right. He says, everybody who thirsts, everybody who desires this new world may freely drink 
of life. The invitation is without regard to a lot of things that you and I think today are so important. I mean, <laughs> you just don't think about it, what's happening in the United Methodist Church, all the brouhaha that's going on over whether we believe this or we believe that, who's going to stay and who's going to leave. It's all based on these things because this new kingdom, this new land, this new world are coming is for you. No matter what you've done, good or bad, it's for you. It's for you, no matter what you have gotten, whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It's for you, no matter who you have known or who knows you, whether you are famous or you are one of those obscure people that nobody knows your name. The only qualification for entry into that new land, that new time, that new kingdom, when Christ sits down with his church, his bride, is that you come to him as a penitent sinner. What does that mean? Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. That's penitence. Acknowledging that you're a sinner. How many sinners do we have in your church? We got them all, right? We got a lot of saints, too. I can be a saint and a sinner. Listen, you can't be both, but you can be a saved sinner. A sinner who has become a saint by God's forgiveness. You come to him as a penitent sinner, knowing that you need a savior and that Jesus is the only possible savior. You come to him trusting in nothing but him. And whether you come or not, listen, this is important. Whether you come to him or not, it's all on you. The invitation is wide open. When is a gift not a gift? When it's rejected, right? Yeah. If, if, if I go over to Ted and I say, Ted, this book I've got for you here, Ted, this, this, this book right here is a gift. It's my gift to you. Now, that book is a gift, right? But what happens if I go this way and Ted says, what? It drops to the ground. You see, it's on us whether we accept this gift or not. So these three conditions exist. Do we like it or not? Do we like some of the good things like, oh, it's, it's free. We don't have to pay for it. No payment possible, actually. Whether or not you come, it's all on you. Jesus paid for our salvation on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us that. God saved you by his grace when you believe and you can't take credit for it. Amen. It's a gift from God. Right. Salvation is not a reward, the scripture says, for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. Beloved, it's an awful thought, a terrible thought to know that he not only died for us, he died because of us. Every sin I, Russell, ever did caused Jesus to be nailed to that cross. I am the reason he had to die. And you are too. Every one of us. And if he did not do this for us, none of us would ever be acceptable to God. The Bible tells us that sin is not something that God will even look at. And if we come into his presence or try to with unconfessed sin, with never acknowledging that we have sin, he will not even look at us, much less entertain embracing us. And if he offers forgiveness as freely as he has given you air to breathe your whole life, what makes you think if that's the promise, the other is the promise as well? The same Lord Jesus who came in history to live a perfect life, to die on the cross in our place, to be buried in a borrowed tomb and raised on the third day, now reveals to us from the right hand of the Father two things, a warning and a promise. 
The promise is of joy and life eternal for the believer who will accept Christ and give himself to God. The warning is of swift judgment and a living death if we reject him. We don't receive that gift that he offers to us, the gift of his son, the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of restoration, and the promise that we will live eternally with him. He's gone. So here's a bottom line for us today. I know, listen, it's only a quarter to twelve. What's the preacher doing finishing? He never finishes this way. That's because I've said it all. Here's the bottom line. You will never need to know anything more about the gospel than you have heard this morning to receive Jesus Christ in your life, in your heart, as Lord of your life, and know the joy of eternal salvation both here and forever. You've heard it all. You've heard the gospel. He came because we are sinners, but he came to forgive us. He died because we couldn't pay that price and still live. He rose again because we could never do that after we die. He ascended back into heaven, his father, and he stands at the right hand of the father. But he's also coming again to judge the living and the dead, those who live in him and those who live without him, those who are living with him and those who are living without him. He's coming to judge the living and the dead. That's the gospel. And Jesus says, in light of all of that, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come to me? question for us is this, will we? Will you? Will I? If you've ever wondered when the dream is going to end, or if it will ever end, now you know. It ends, and real life begins when you trust the Lion of Judah who died for you. Now the final prayer to end the book of the unveiling of Jesus Christ is to be uttered only by those who have trusted Christ. What is the final prayer? Even so, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come back, Lord Jesus. We're ready. Can you say that? We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Say it with me. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And as the book really ends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. What a fitting hymn we're going to sing when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Let's stand together.